Hi, my name is Dr. Robert Groisman with COVIDinstitute.org. And today I wanted to talk about long COVID versus long vax slash COVID vaccine injury. Are they the same thing? Well, after some snarky remarks um, in, um, on some of my videos on, on YouTube, um, I wanted to address uh, both, both topics, both uh, long, long COVID and uh, COVID vaccine injury. Um, so the FLCCC protocol the I recover protocol treats both vaccine injury and long COVID the same way, but they are different. Their symptoms may be similar uh, in some people, but um, some just have long COVID, not COVID vaccine injury. Others have the COVID vaccine injury, but not long COVID. It depends on what you've had. Uh, and if you were or were not vaccinated. If you had both COVID-19 infection and you were vaccinated for COVID, then it becomes muddled. Let's look at what the CDC says on their webpage. Um, All COVID-19 vaccines prompt our bodies to recognize and help protect us from the virus that causes COVID-19. Okay, Um, I'll give them that. Currently, there are two types of COVID-19 vaccines for use in the United States, the mRNA vaccines and the protein subunit vaccines. None of these vaccines can give you COVID-19. That is true. And that is because vaccines or the COVID vaccines do not use any live virus. That's also true. Vaccines cannot cause infection with the virus that causes COVID-19 or other viruses. From the, from, the, from the two vaccine types that are available in the United States, that is true. Um, here's a statement they make. After vaccination, the mRNA will enter the muscle cells. That's where it's injected. It's intramuscular injection. Once inside, they use the cell's machinery, and the machinery is the ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum that takes the mRNA and turns it into a protein. To, it's called translation, to produce a harmless piece of what is called a spike protein. Well, we know that it's not so harmless, right? Uh, they also say they do not affect or interact with our DNA. Well, that is also questionable. Um, granted that the mRNA molecule has no way of moving from the side of the cell to the nucleus. However, with enough quantity, uh, there is coincidental entrance possible. These vaccines do not enter the nucleus of the cell where our DNA genetic material is located, so it cannot change or influence our genes. Well, I'll discuss that on the next page. Let's look at the actual vaccines. Uh, The top the top two that are available in the United States right now are Pfizer and Moderna. We'll talk about the Novavax um, in a bit. So they're, they're mRNA vaccines. They're non-replicating vaccines. That means that they're not able to enter your cell and make virus or make more of themselves. Um, all they can do is make um, a protein. Each has an mRNA coding for a different fragment of a spike protein. This mRNA fragment is supposed to be translated by ribosomes inside the cell. That protein becomes the spike protein fragment. Now, there's been some DNA contamination talk about small pieces of DNA in earlier Um, versions of the vaccines. I do not know if this is still going on with the current uh, vaccines. Let's talk about mRNA integration. Normally, the CDC is correct, and an mRNA molecule or fragment uh, will just get translated into a protein and be released. 
Um, however, if you have enough mRNA fragments, uh, we have inside our nucleus remnants from old viral infections um, of RNA uh, polymerase and RNA RNA reverse transcriptase. These are something our, our DNA does not need, our cells don't need, but they're remnants of prior viral infections. Uh, the one in particular we know is called line one, and it can interact with mRNA to turn it into DNA. So both of these have a potential, have a potential of, of, uh, of being integrated or being incorporated into our genetic material, even though it's unlikely and improbable, it's not impossible. Novavax um, it uses a different technology, and this uses a, a protein or an antigen instead of an mRNA, along with an activator, something to really get the <clears throat> to get the immune system going. Um, and the last one, these are have not been used in the U.S. Uh, since the Johnson and Johnson one, but those involve the adenovirus, and that is a replicating uh, vaccine virus. They they used cold virus. Um, and incorporated a small piece of the COVID-19 uh, to be recognized by immune system. Um, Johnson, Johnson, Janssen are no longer available in the United States due to um, several issues. Let's talk about um, vaccine injuries, uh, whether we call them long vax or vaccine injuries. Um, it's real. I want to tell you that I acknowledge it as a physician. I have seen it. I have treated it. These are real problems. Adverse events, even though they describe them as rare, uh, can occur in up to 20% of those vaccinated. Now, a, a, a large part of them will be uh, short-lived and uh, will, be, will include things like fatigue, brain fog, general malaise, and fever. And those generally resolve within one or two weeks. However, there's a significant number of people who will develop myocarditis or pericarditis. Uh, the first one means inflammation of the heart, and pericarditis means inflammation of the surrounding of the heart. There's a sac. Blood clots. Now, we're not talking about microclots here. We're talking about big clots that can cause a stroke or a heart attack and can cause sudden death. And this can be delayed. After, after the vaccine by, by many weeks, even months. The most common, though, that are seen are fatigue and the brain fog. POTS, 61% um, of, of, of patients who have, have um, had vaccinations uh, can develop POTS. General malaise. Paresthesias, this is a big one. A lot of patients complain about this. Pins and needles. There's been evidence of nerve axon inflammation from biopsies done. And 52% of people were showing small fiber neuropathy. However, um, how devastating the vaccine injury um, is, there's still way more cases of long COVID than long vax. Who's responsible? Well, there's a program that the U.S. government has called the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, CICP. It was established to handle vaccine injuries. However, according to the government data, they received more than 12,000 COVID-related claims. 32 out of those 12,000 12, uh, have been deemed eligible for compensation. And 1,129, that's 97% of those that applied have been denied. Four people so far out of the 12,000 have been paid. And they received an average of 2,148. Of course, the pharmaceutical companies who develop the product should be responsible. However, they are indemnified. Uh, this is per the government. They were made immune from any lawsuits or, or issues uh, relating to these vaccines. Um, I hope I've been able to explain the difference between long COVID and long vax or uh, COVID vaccine injury. Uh, please subscribe and like my videos. Thank you. Bye-bye.